Hi, everyone. It's Joe Venary, the host of Fit Insider, the show where I talk with the entrepreneurs, executives, and investors who are redefining the business of fitness and wellness. Today, I'm joined by John Kenrick. John is the managing director at North Castle Partners, a leading private equity firm focused on the healthy living sectors. In today's episode, we discuss the evolving fitness landscape, why John doesn't buy into the gym apocalypse, and we explore North Castle's investments in berries, Echelon, Crunch Fitness, and more. Let's get into it. Hi, John. Welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to get into it and, and kind of jumping right in. Obviously, North Castle Partners has become a leading go-to private equity firm in the kind of healthy living markets. Can you tell us more about the firm and what types of businesses you're focused on? Yeah, sure. North Castle has been exclusively focused on health and wellness uh, really since the late 90s when we uh, got started. And the definition has sort of evolved over time. But we we spend probably 40% of our time in nutrition. Uh, so sort of everything that you eat, uh, drink, ingest in any sort of way, vitamins, minerals, and supplements, weight loss, healthy food, healthy beverage, probably 40% of our time in active uh, living, uh, which of course, in, of course includes the, the fitness market, but any active lifestyle type of, of uh, business. And then 20% of our time in a handful of other categories, including uh, beauty and personal care, uh, some household uh, products that sort of support the healthy and active life and other brands sort of focused on premium or, or better or upgraded um, uh, living. That would be the types of businesses that we, uh, that, we, that we focus on. And you mentioned there, when was the firm started and, and how long has your bit involvement been? Sure. Um, the firm got started in um, 1997. Uh, our founder, Chip Baird, uh, bought a vitamin business called Liner Health Products in 1997. That's North Castle One. It was a special purpose vehicle, uh, the first formal fund uh, or fund that was uh, uh, raised to go do a number of different investments was formed in 1998. Uh, I joined in 2001 uh, as an associate uh, after two years of investment banking and have really spent um, yeah, obviously the significant majority of my career here and have been a partner here for the last uh, eight or nine years. Right. So it's been quite a while and obviously the market has changed or matured quite a bit since then. Can you talk about how you've seen it evolve over your career and kind of how that's impacted the types of companies that you've, you've worked on in those deals? Yeah, so uh, there's there's probably a couple things that I would point to, but the most um, significant change that I've seen is the types of businesses that need capital and the the, the uses or needs of that capital. Um, I think it is increasingly difficult to build a uh, high growth cash flow bo- uh, positive business. Um, from a young age, and, and it was always obviously a big challenge for entrepreneurs to do that. Um, but we used to see, you know, many more family-owned businesses where the family uh, founder uh, were, were, were the single shareholders. And today, uh, more and more companies need to raise significantly more capital than they did uh, a decade or two decades ago uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, one is obviously the cost of technology. Technology plays a role in consumer. There's a big uh, blending between tech and consumer businesses. And so it is just much harder to start a business on your own uh, that does not require outside, uh, outside funding. And the second thing, and I guess it's related to technology, is the cost to acquire customers uh, is generally more complex and harder than it used to be. On the other hand, it's much easier to start a business uh, as far as just getting it up and running and having some access to customers, right? So if it's a CPG business, you don't necessarily need to win the Whole Foods account or the Target account to get into business, which is obviously very difficult. You could launch on Amazon or launch on your own website. But conversely, the cost of doing that uh, and finding growth are quite high. And so we're just seeing different types of investment opportunities than we, than we did you know, 10 or even five years ago. Um, the other significant difference uh, is just the competition on our side. There's um, uh, a ton of investment firms, both on venture and private equity, uh, you know, looking for health and wellness brands and exciting uh, growth brands. And so just the number of firms and the sheer amount of capital available is uh, is extraordinarily high. With that, 
how do you differentiate between all these different opportunities at this point, fitness and wellness, as you mentioned, that that's, it's increased the competition, um, from the investment side, but with every company, it seems like having some type of fitness or certainly wellness angle, how do you distinguish between, you know, what's an established vertical, what's an emerging vertical where you can even invest your time and energy and those opportunities kind of across the board? Yeah. I mean, for the most part, uh, businesses evolve from existing concepts and other businesses out there. Certainly, occasionally, there is a you know extremely new and differentiated business. But but you know, for the most part, things are evolving from existing concepts. And so, in the fitness market, it, you know, Planet Fitness, which is really an incredible. Uh, was an incredibly new idea, uh, almost revolutionary idea to be able to charge $10 a month and run a profitable fitness club, right? That's that, that certainly, um, you know, the idea of a full service uh, fitness club or a, or a uh, club with, you know, full, full size of equipment of cardio and strength, et cetera, was not a new idea, but the pricing model was new, right? Is that a, um, a revolution or an evolution? Uh, and then, you know, you can make the same argument on the boutique side. Um, you know, how long has boutique fitness been around? I think a lot of people want to point to, you know, Soul Cycle and say they, you know, really revolutionized the fitness industry when they started a standalone spin concept. And it was certainly an incredible advancement, uh, taking a, a spin class out of a gym and putting it into a standalone environment. Um, they certainly weren't the first company to, to do that, uh, but they evolved, uh, uh, you know, concepts that had been that has been around in different ways. And so I think more stuff is, is evolution rather than revolution. Uh, and I think the same could be said in the nutrition side of the market where, uh, you know, Atkins was something incredibly new and, and different with low carb eating when that came out. And now is keto something, you know, completely new and, and different, or is it a sort of next generation version um, of, of that. And it depends on, you know, what lens you, you look at. And then occasionally, of course, you do see things that are more, um, truly unique and different. So on the nutrition side, the one example that comes to mind is the idea of fasting, uh, which is gaining, uh, momentum and, and, and people are coming more and more aware of either intermittent fasting on a daily basis or occasional multi-day fasting and the, the benefits of that. And, you know, I think that's, more unique and different than perhaps other, you know, new diets that have you know come out coming on over the years. Absolutely. And there's that, you talked about the evolution or revolution and kind of how these things materialize over time and they may not be that different than what preceded them. A couple that you mentioned there, the, the fasting, keto, things of that nature. As you start to think about these emerging verticals, what does it take for something to get to the level where you start to take interest to see if it's uh, kind of the opportunity for a private equity size investment? What does that take to get to that stage? Yeah, you try to understand market size. And, and if, if something is um, uh, sort of rather small today, but playing in what is a very, very big market, and you can talk to enough customers um, and understand the science uh, then you can start to gain confidence in how big something can get. So we are, um, you know, big proponents of uh, understanding uh, the science behind either a fitness trend um, or a nutrition trend. And if the science is there, uh, then generally speaking, you know, we we can get comfortable that something maybe a very small idea or concept today, but it has uh, the capacity to, uh, you know, to to, to grow. Quite a lot, and then other things are a little bit harder to, uh, you know, think about how big something can get. So if you looked at, you know, Barry's, for example, back when we made that investment, it was a rather small company, and you may say, okay, how big is the market for premium, high intensity interval training? And that's you know one way to define it, or you could say, how big is the market for premium? really uh, terrific workouts and and you know ultimately with something like that it was all about the the brand but also the science behind that type of workout which we really uh believed in at the time and obviously continue to believe in 
Um, and so uh, understanding that is a, is a really big part uh, of it. But ultimately, you know, these are probably the, one of the, the, the hardest things about what we do is picking, you know, picking the winners out there. Right. Thinking about that and some of the conversations I've had to this point with, you know, more early stage uh, venture capitalists or angel investors who are talking about, you know, when they're getting a pitch deck, it might be pre-revenue, pre-product in some instances. So they're looking at the founders, the team, the background, the unique kind of experience or lens that they bring to an opportunity, as well as some of the things you mentioned, which is how big can this get? What is the total addressable market? Um, What is it going to take to get there? How similar or different are those two kind of lenses or filters? Um, obviously, your stage is a little bit more into the the unit economics um, and digging into the details. But would you say there are similarities or differences in those two kind of stages? And, and what are some of those things? Yeah, well, there's certainly similarities. And, and then obviously, there's differences from the, the, the proof of concept standpoint. So let me just start with the similarities. Everyone's looking at adjustable market, right? And, and how try to assess how big a concept can be and how competitive uh, that is. So how different is this new business that you're choosing to back if you're a venture capitalist? And how much market share do you think it can grab? Or how much is that market going to grow to the extent it's really you know, something that doesn't, doesn't fully exist? today. And, and, and we're looking at that same thing, but with a little bit more data, right? A little bit more, okay, they've proven that they can sell, you know, 20 or $25 million worth of this product or that they can operate, uh, you know, five or six of these locations. So does that help us believe that they could operate, you know, another 40 or 50 or, uh, or a hundred of them? Uh, whereas obviously on the venture side, you're making that call um, a little bit more, uh, on, on confidence in the team and the idea, but you haven't actually gotten to see that you know come to reality uh, at all. And so I think that's that's a that, that's a key. You know, again, on the similar side, everyone's looking for great management. Everyone's looking for a phenomenal CEO who may or may not be the the founder, uh, but in the case of founders, you're looking for that uh, entrepreneur you really believe in and you can back and can motivate a team and. Uh, build, but also, at least for, for North Castle, I won't speak for the whole market, also be a great partner. Right? There's a lot of great entrepreneurs out there, and I think you have to assess you know, who, who it is that you think you can work with well, and, and, and people that are coming to you uh, uh, as an investor for a reason, not just for uh, the capital, because there's certainly lots of places out there to, to get capital. And I think, I think so. There's, there's plenty of similarities between you know, market sizing and, and, uh, and team. But again, on the, on the sort of slightly later stage or middle stage that North Castle comes in at, we obviously have the, the benefit of the data uh, and whether a concept is actually working or not and, and how a brand has evolved, right? If a brand is an idea on a piece of paper, you know, that's one thing. A brand that has actually come to life, has a social following, um, has a personality, is something you could actually go out and talk to consumers about and understand more about how they perceive that brand and how much they use that brand and their loyalty, et cetera, right? There's just a lot more that, that one could look at. Of course, we're coming in at a much more, you know, higher valuation than a venture capitalist do. So it's a different, it's just a different, uh, you know, business model altogether. But there's, there's obviously those, those, you know, similarities and differences. Sure. And a couple of the concepts that you mentioned, the there's the planet fitnesses of the world, the kind of high volume, um, lower price point. Then there's berries that you mentioned, that premium experience. When you start to look at the the fitness landscape in general, there's a lot of things that are starting to bubble up in the ecosystem, whether that's the gym apocalypse or the boutique fitness bubble. Um, what do you think is happening in the brick and mortar fitness landscape? On the on the the, the... The gym side or the four wall side, you know, there's obviously this just just continued growth of HBLP, led by Planet Fitness, but significant growth coming out of Crunch, uh, which you know, full disclosure, I'm sure you know, but the your your listeners, we are an investor in uh, the leading HIZ in the Crunch system, but uh, you're you're seeing significant growth out of that out of that market, which just seems to be resonating with consumers uh, who can go and you know have a have a good experience. And, and pay obviously a lot less than they're going to pay at a, uh, a more uh, traditional or older uh, business model gym. At the same time, there are there are plenty of consumers that that are very willing and happy to pay a you know, much higher price at a at a, a lifetime or or an Equinox or uh, all sorts of other uh, premium 
uh, uh, full service gyms out there uh, where they're where they're investing far more in their content and their classes and you know offering great experiences um, at a much higher price, but again delivering a value that that consumer uh, really appreciates. I think in the, the really hard place in the fitness industry, and this isn't new, just continues to be the, the middle uh, price points where uh, you're offering obviously more than the HDLP guys and you have classes, et cetera, but perhaps not as premium of an experience as the Equinox of the world. So I think more of those customers are apt to trade down uh, when the opportunity presents itself. And, and I think one of the interesting things you see on that trade down idea is they may not be trading down in total spend. Um, they're just changing how they allocate it, right? So I can spend I don't know, 10 or $20 a month to go to crunch in a given market, but then supplement that with boutique fitness, right? So yeah, I'm not getting the great classes that I would get maybe if I joined uh, Equinox as opposed to Planet Fitness, but I could use that money that I saved to take uh, a variety of uh, boutique fitness classes. And then I think within the boutique side, uh, you know, there's a lot of stores out there. Um, how close is boutique fitness from saturation? Is it at saturation? Is it over saturation? Uh, certainly a question that a lot of people are asking. And I think it really depends on uh, what type of environment you're looking in. Is it a New York City, San Francisco urban environment? Is it a smaller urban environment or, or even a suburban environment? Uh, you know, I tend to believe that, you know, the total number of boutique fitness studios in a big city like New York is is really at a high. Uh, and I, I do not see that number increasing. Of course, you'll see some people come in, some people come out, but I, I, I do not believe we're going to see uh, a tremendous number of uh, net new boutique fitness uh, offerings. But across the nation, uh, just based on the sheer number of franchises, franchises, excuse me, that have been sold but not yet open, if people are going to meet the sort of contracts that they've signed, uh, there's still a lot more stores that are coming. Again, just based on the backlog of that delta and, and those leading franchise uh, franchise or concepts are continuing to sell, uh, you know, huge numbers of new uh, locations for their various concepts. And so I don't know where that ends. I don't know what their economics, you know, look like. Uh, but I do know that there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot more locations that, uh, at least in theory, should, you know, will be will be opening over the next, you know, two three years. Sure. Even if you you look at the just exponentials, orange theories, and F45s alone. You can, there's thousands of studios yep. that are slated to roll out. Um, we don't know, like you mentioned, the, the specifics of what's going on there from a utilization and getting those opened. But digging into the, the crunch model a little bit more, it, it seems like as the technology, connected fitness, and on-demand fitness, and even the competition for boutiques, that it would be applying pressure to the the high volume model, but they're continuing to grow and do fantastic, as you mentioned. What are some of those specific levers that they're able to pull that keeps them competitive and growing, even though this sure. kind of disruption is coming? Yeah. yeah no, I'm, I'm not a big believer in the gym apocalypse uh, sort of concept. I mean, I, I do believe it shifts uh, where people spend their money and how they spend their money. And so, you know, you guys wrote an article uh, fairly recently and quoted data, uh, right about the, the I forget what, what the source you quoted was, but that SoulCycle looked like they had a tough start to the year uh, as compared to December, as compared to the same period in the prior year. I don't remember exactly what that uh, said. And, I, you know, I think that there's some concern out there that, you know, Peloton has taken people out of the boutique spin studios. And, you know, I don't have a, a strong opinion on whether that's true uh, or, or not, but certainly something that, you know, we read in, in Fit Insider and, and in other, you know, in other places. But in, in general, uh, people, I think, that are active home fitness users, be it Peloton or be it any other uh, home fitness uh, 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 business, um, are also going to brick and mortar concepts. Uh, people do crave community. They want to work out in a different environment. Most at-home fitness fitness workouts are not offering everything you need. Yes, you can lift weights at home, but I think more people than not are going to the gym to lift weights or to be surrounded by people or to have a personal training session or to use the other amenities that are available, You know, even in the HVLP concepts, right, where you have 
uh, the hydro massage beds or the tanning beds uh, as different uh, ways that people can enjoy the, you know, the crunch model or the planet model. And so there's lots of reasons that people go to uh, the gym. They may want to spin twice a week at home, but they want to do something else. They want to take a yoga class. They, again, they want to lift weights, hopefully uh, something that everybody should be doing, right? Cardio only is not the, uh, the best way to, for long-term uh, fitness. You know, everyone needs to uh, use resistance training of some sorts. And yes, of course, you can follow videos and do that at home. But remember, that's not new, right? Home, the home fitness market, uh, whether it be the equipment market of Bowflex, for example, or, or the DVD industry is uh, obviously the, the VHS industry before that, um, is not a new concept, right? People have been using home content for, for, for ages and ages. Um, obviously, there is more of it now. The barriers to entry go to our conversation earlier about the barriers to entry or ease of starting a business have come way down. And so you, you see an incredible amount of content out there. Um, and so I'm sure usage overall is up. Uh, I don't think there's any question about that. Um, but we shouldn't forget that home fitness equipment and home fitness content are not really new. They're evolving just like many, many other experiential categories or categories evolve uh, for the for the consumer. I, I, I just, again, I don't subscribe to the idea that we're all going to work out at home. Um, the, uh, the, the trends toward the desire to work out and be healthier are so strong. Um, the number of workouts people are doing are increasing. And again, I think they're just doing some of that at home and some of that in a physical location. Right. And there's a lot in there to think about part of it is being, you know, as more people are interested in living a healthier lifestyle and as there's more access across all these different paths, whether that's the gym, the studio, the at home, the streaming on demand, the the hope ultimately is that that just means more people are working out. It really doesn't matter how they're choosing to do it because they'll just have more opportunity across the, the landscape and spectrum. Yeah, no, precisely. There was a, a really good piece of research, um, by uh, a group called LEK, a consulting firm. I don't have it in, in front of me, but it, it suggested that you know home uh, Peloton users are more likely to be working out it, 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 you know outside of their home as well. So that sort of the increased appetite for fitness, which which Peloton is probably helping, uh, because people you know once you see good results, you're more likely to continue. Right? We we are. Uh, we, we as creatures respond to positive reinforcement. Uh, and so there is this synergy um, uh, to getting people to work out more. Uh, and again, it's just very what people are doing, right? So your friends work out more, therefore you work out more. We're social, you know, we're social creatures. We, we, we care about the way we look, uh, um, or many, many of us do. And that, uh, again, sort of fosters uh, I think just just uh, increase in total usage, both inside and uh, and outside the home. Yeah, I agree with that point. That's something that actually, uh, when I was talking to uh, Rick Stolmeyer of Mind Body, he said the same thing. He said, you know, we're actually very excited about the Pelotons of the world, um, Echelon Fitness, connected home devices, because the, all the data that we're looking at. It, this is encouraging people to go to the gym and the studio even more. Um, so it's it's kind of promising in that sense that that everybody wins. One interesting thing, and this is actually something we we wrote about recently, when you look at the trend towards gym memberships, participation, spending on fitness, it's in and wellness and nutrition in general, health. It's you know up and to the right, but at the same time, obesity rates are increasing. Overall health. It's kind of declining along with life expectancy. Do you think about, or does North Castle or the businesses you've invested in think about that discrepancy? Maybe like, what are we missing from those two sides? Yeah, um, I, you know, absolutely. And it's certainly, uh, you know, frustrating that we don't see meaningful, uh, you know, or positive improvements, you know, in, in, those, in those stats. And there's so many different societal factors uh, at play now. I think um, you are seeing perhaps the younger generation, I don't know the, the, the data, but just based on my experience, probably staying in better shape than prior generations. And so I'm, I'm an optimist that over a very long period of time, we will see uh, an improvement in uh, overweight and, and obese uh, percentages. Uh, but that 
these the, the trends that we like to talk about and and the the sort of the crowd that that perhaps is fueling all of this uh, you know uh i don't want to put an exact age on it because this is fueled by lots of different you know generations but certainly the younger people are working out at a at a much more intense level than perhaps their their parents generation um and i'm an optimist that that will translate into better lifelong habits and when you hit the different stress points in your life, be it career, marriage, family, um, that that fitness will be so ingrained in people because they started younger uh, and in a more serious way um, that we will see those long-term improvements. You know, as for uh, the, the the life expectancy uh, uh, decline, uh, and as you said, the mental health issues. Um, you know, I think fitness is a a, a great tool for improvement there, but the solutions needed there fall obviously, uh, you know, well outside uh, of the of the fitness industry. Uh, these are significant problems. But I would say that that the part of my reason or, or belief that we're not anywhere uh, close to a gym apocalypse is in some ways mental health, that, that we need breaks from our devices. We all work very hard. Um, I know for me, one of the things I love about boutique fitness and guided fitness in, 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 in general, so whether that's uh, a ride on my echelon uh, bike or a workout at Barry's or SLT uh, or even climbing, what I do with my kids at Brooklyn Boulders, and of course, all these brands I just mentioned are part of our portfolio, so right. uh, full, <laughs> full, full, fully acknowledge that for your, for your audience. My phone is in my locker um, or my phone is away from me if I'm on the home bike. And it's a true escape where I'm really, uh, um, uh, you know, immersing myself in that fitness experience, listening to the instructor. I think that's one of the real benefits of guided fitness. I think that's one of the reasons that it's doing so well is is we really do need uh, the break. And and I think it is, uh, you know, a really positive thing for uh, for mental health and and leaving leaving that phone in my locker and, and starting a sixty minute. Uh, Barry's class is a really nice break from that, you know, device and the the pings of the text messages and uh, the alerts about politics and all of the things that add, you know, stress to the rest of my day. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. It's, you know, helps me maintain my sanity, um, disconnect and kind of blow off steam, um, but also just maintain you know, ultimately at the end of the day, it's like one of my hobbies at this point. It's, I, I look forward to working out, going to the gym, going for a run. Um, and I, I too am optimistic about the trends and the direction that, that things are heading in terms of access um, and, and just various ways that people are going to be able to kind of pick and choose what works for them instead of having to be put into a box, you know, literally and figuratively about, you know, going to the gym at this time for this class. Um, so it'll be interesting yep. to, to see. Um and I love the evolution of business models. Sorry to, sorry no. to interrupt you. That that are trying to make everything more accessible, right? And that's what's so great about HPLP. There's a really, you know, some really interesting wellness platforms out there with increasingly strong, you know, fitness content um, where price points are accessible and they're meant to be social. There's this really cool company called Burn Along that 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 has you know great content out there for largely sort of sold through corporate or health plans and, um, you know, reaching uh, an audience that Barry's could never reach due to, you know, all sorts of factors, locations, price points, et cetera. And so uh, I do, you know, I, I'm a big fan of businesses that are, you know, trying to reach into a wider and wider audience versus, you know, being, you know, New York or LA sort of centric in your, in your business or your thinking. Yeah. Digging into that a little bit more, you mentioned obviously echelon and investment of yours, the connected fitness landscape becoming more crowded, whether that's folks that are starting with one piece of equipment and then, you know, sticking to that, diversifying, launching just the the digital or streaming, not the, the equipment. Um, what was the opportunity you saw in echelon and how is it, you know, standing out and differentiating in that landscape? So I, I have just tremendous respect for what Peloton has accomplished. And, and I sort of mentioned before that neither home content nor home hardware uh, in fitness is, is, or neither is a new concept. But obviously what, what um, uh, has evolved is sort of bringing those two things together into a connected experience. I think with Echelon, uh, our founder and CEO, 
saw an opportunity to create a product that had a uh, lower price point, but still very high quality and uh, a content strategy that was designed to appeal perhaps a little bit differently than the other other companies in the market. And by, by, by doing so, I think we've been able to reach uh, perhaps a, a, a different audience than a Hydro or a Peloton or, or even a Tonal is reaching today. I don't have hard data on you know, how many Echelon owners own any of the other pieces of equipment out there. My suspicion is that there's very little, very little overlap uh, there. And so it's it's been uh, exciting. Um, you know, the other the other thing that, that that Echelon is trying to do differently is reach people uh, in stores as opposed to purely D to C. Obviously, Peloton has a, a, a multi-channel approach as well with their own boutiques, which you know something that Echelon will not be pursuing. But we are pursuing strategies of selling at Costco or or Walmart and. Uh, different models there, different price points. And we are uh, at a number of other retailers, Johnson Fitness, Academy uh, Sports, and working on on some exciting new distribution opportunities to to hopefully make a wider and wider audience aware of Echelon who may not be following us on social media or being served up our, our direct advertisements. But uh, are in you know Bed Bath and Beyond or Best Buy or you know one of these retailers sometime in the future. Uh, we hope to be growing our uh, you know our distribution across uh, across the wide variety of retailers. I think it's exciting to see that landscape kind of shift and it's happening very quickly. Um, do you think that as there are new entrants and whether you mentioned Peloton or Echelons that it becomes much like the gym landscape, that they're just for different audiences and different consumers? Or is it a competition on price and content and instructors and some of the things that, you know, maybe you see pop up when, when it comes to the content, but also in, you know, boutique studios, for example, they talk a lot about, oh, the instructor talent, the amenities, um, price point. How do those things, you know, what's the competition look like? Yeah. I think that different um, businesses, for various reasons, appeal to different audiences. So, you know, I'll use my own example before I get back to Echelon of Barry's competes in, in, in some locations, you know, sort of head on with Orange Theory, right? So Upper West Side of Manhattan, Chelsea of Manhattan, it's about everywhere, right? Because there's Orange Theory, is just about everywhere. So wherever there's a Barry's, there's an Orange Theory, uh, obviously not not the other way around. Yet both businesses, I think, are thriving uh, because they appeal to a different consumer. And is there some overlap? There's always some overlap. I couldn't tell you exactly what percentage that is, but I don't think it's that big. And I think the same thing for some of these other competitors in the market. Of course, there's always somebody who you know might choose, uh, might be, might be, you know, studying both brands and deciding which one to purchase. But I also think that there's uh, uh, just like in the car industry and just like in, oh God, you know, every industry, right? There's competition. Uh, there's brands that stand for something uh, different uh, with a uh, sort of uh, uh, an, uh, an attempt to have content that's appealing to a different consumer and price points that are, that are different. And so um, there's a, there's a big, there's a big market out there. The market is, is growing, I think, uh, quickly. Um, the desire for these great home experiences is growing. Uh, and I just think there's wide variety of audiences out there and uh, different, uh, you know, different brands, uh, appeal to different people. Yeah, I agree completely. And there's one thing that has come up a couple of times now is, is, is berries. Of course, there was the, the rumor that berries was potentially up for sale. I wanted to give you the opportunity to break the news here. Um, if, if what, <laughs> what was happening, um, what that looks like. And of course the news as well, that, uh, the spin studio, the concept recently opened, um, so what is the, the plan with Barry's? To this point, it's been very intentional growth, um, international expansion. What does that horizon look like? Yeah, we're, we're really excited about where Barry's uh, uh, is. Um, as you said, it has been intentional growth, and, and we've, we've wanted to grow uh, our footprint um, and our infrastructure in step with each other and not open up stores that we were not prepared to support from a marketing perspective or a talent perspective. And so with a really premium experience like Barry's, I think you have to be careful about uh, how fast you expand it because 
ultimately that class is our product, right? And we have to replicate that 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 great experience many, many times over across all of these different markets. And so uh, it's been a lot of fun uh, to bring Barry's with his management team, tremendous management team led by Joey Gonzalez, um, to you know cities across the country and countries across the world. I think we are really one of the uh, most global fitness brands uh, out there at this point. And certainly, uh, um, I think we, we think we're one of the most premium uh, global fitness brands, uh, arguably the most premium, uh, the, the, the standpoint of how many countries we are now uh, in. And, and it's very exciting. We have inquiries from all over the world um, on, on a regular basis about where, you know, where people want to see uh, Barry's open next, and that's both, you know, globally and domestically. You know, we've we've also started to play with some new ideas. We think Barry's is about uh, this amazing combination of, of high-intensity interval cardio and strength training. I mentioned strength training earlier in this conversation. Uh, I still think it's one of the most underpenetrated parts of the fitness market, and I think that will continue to grow. More and more people are learning that cardio alone is not the right way to work out for the long run. You have to engage your muscles for, for, for real health and, and our optimal health, I should say. And really, ultimately, the best way to fight weight gain is, is through you know, strength training. You, know, you need to keep up your uh, metabolic rate. And uh, of course, cardio is, is critical too. But um, So anyway, we've always thought Barry's is really about the combination of cardio and strength. And so, you know, we've, we've obviously been specifically known for the running uh, side, but the reality is you can get that cardio other ways. And so we're really excited to, to, to be launching Barry's Ride today. Uh, the day we're recording this uh, is day uh, one. And so we'll see, you know, how the consumer responds, but we're pretty optimistic that people are going to uh, you know, experience the same great uh, uh, dual workout that they do with Barry's, but they're going to do it on a bike instead of a tread. And then the other concept that has been really successful for us is lift, which is really just a strength training class. And and so, you know, with lift, obviously people, uh, most of our consumers for lift are also taking uh, traditional Barry's classes where other days they're getting their cardio and strength. And uh, sometimes they're getting, the, you know, that strength uh, alone. And so, we run that class in a handful of our locations where we had enough space for a second, a second studio. So, you know, with Barry's, we've again sort of expanded it in a big way domestically and internationally. And now there are a couple of new, uh, new concepts. Uh, of course, our apparel has expanded through. Uh, you may know we did a, a really exciting collaboration with Lululemon earlier this year, uh, or excuse me, earlier in uh, uh, summer of 2019 which was a huge success for, for both brands. And, and so lots of ways to leverage the Barry's brand and the experience uh, to bring it to more and more uh, consumers. I think that with Barry's, it's, you're right, people just can't seem to get enough. And when you talk about uh, a cult-like following, Barry's is the quintessential example of that. Um, so I'm sure, there, I'm sure there's a lot of upside in terms of new concepts, apparel, and, and you know, pretty much anything the brand wants to do, it, as long as it is that intentional kind of focused growth to maintain that quality. Absolutely. No, no question about it. And, and we will uh, never grow faster than we think we can develop our capability to deliver that, you know, all over, all over the world. And wrapping up here and, and thinking about the time you've been, you know, kind of involved in the industry, all the different concepts you've seen, what's happened to this point. Um, is there anything going forward that you're excited about a bold prediction or just what you're looking forward to as the industry continues to evolve? No, I mean, I listen, I, I spent a lot of my efforts in fitness, specifically North Castle, across the whole wellness landscape, as we talked about earlier. You know, I think predicting revolutionary concepts are really hard. That's what great uh, entrepreneurs are so uh, talented at and get rewarded for when they when they launch something incredible that, you know, survives. And, you know, we're, you know, obviously more focused on what is budding and what is trending and what's coming out and where are the great brands and the great entrepreneurs you know, behind those brands once they're established. But, um, you know, we, I guess, uh, believe we'll continue to see uh, people offering um, tremendous uh, uh, experiences, high quality, backed by great brands that, that have loyal, passionate followings. And that's really, you know, we, we, we think more and more of that. You'll, you'll always have this, I think, continued bifurcation of the price point, people that want to get something at a, at a tremendous value, but still great a great experience. And then obviously on the premium side, we're 
whether it's fitness or apparel or uh, other categories, but I think there's sort of increasing the hourglass consumer or or or, or that trend will uh, continue. You know, I'd say the only thing, if I'm going to point out one thing that we continue to love and we've 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 backed, is the idea of experiential uh, retail or experiences. Going back to the concept uh, before about you know being overwhelmed by our devices, I think more opportunities we get to put those devices away and be present in an experience. Uh, whether that be a fitness experience or uh, or something different, uh, whether it's sport or just, you know, game, puzzle, museum, uh, et cetera. You know, we're really excited about a lot, lot of the really interesting things that, that continue to develop on places where people to go and have a good time. I and mean, whether they're Instagramming that or not is sort of a nice secondary, but hopefully they're engaging in the activity and with people they're with more than they are with their cell phones in those moments. And and so we're, we're looking for businesses like, you know, like that, uh, but obviously continue to follow all of the trends in nutrition and, and fitness, and, and we'll stay true to our primary investment areas for, for many, many years to come. Yeah, it's an exciting time and certainly a ton of opportunity. Looking forward to, to seeing how that all evolves. And I appreciate you taking a few minutes today to tell us all about that. So I'm excited to share this conversation uh, with our listeners when it's, when it's ready to go live. Cool. Well, it was, uh, it was great to be with you and uh, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Okay. Thanks everyone for listening to today's episode. For more from Fit Insider, visit insider.fit.co and subscribe to our weekly newsletter for insights and analysis on the business of fitness and wellness. Then go ahead and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. See you next time.